Okay, so with this video, I want to start getting into the actual Lua coating, but to me, before we really start talking about Lua, one of the big things you want to talk about, and it's the big reason for using some of these higher level languages, is the, you know, the fact that you can work in a modular way. You don't have to have one giant, you know, 10,000 line script for everything. Because um, that gets hard to edit, it gets hard to find stuff, um, hard to debug. It just, to me, it's more of a pain all around. Um, so that's where creating small modules that you can then test and work with and then start using in other stuff. And you don't have to keep repeating the same code over and over again. You can just have your main files and import from there or require from there and then use those functions and use those features and all that. Um, now it's important to note if you're going to do this in Cheat Engine, we need a way to be able to distribute that without having to distribute a folder with all the files in it and the cheat table. So that's where we're going to start with this pack or table file package loader and the table file package searcher. Um, and these just use some underlying things that Lua provides um, the way it actually requires stuff. Um, we'll go over that a bit. Um, actually understanding these functions on screen now aren't super important, um, but I will go over it so you can kind of get an idea of what's going on there. Um, the main thing I want to go over on in this video is actually requiring a simple file and then calling those functions. It kind of is a recap of what I've done in a previous one, but because of how I'm importing change, I just wanted to kind of recap that and I feel like this Lua series should be a or at least I finally did decide I want this Lua series to be a you know from you know almost nothing of Lua um, about the only thing is just a simple concept of what an if statement is and what a function is and that's about all I'm really expecting you to know coming into this um, so before we really get into heavy coding and making actual modules we're gonna use I just want to cover how we're going to import it. Um, and I think some of that's important because if you don't know where it's going to be looking when you use require, it's going to be hard for you to even start off the bat. And then I'll even go over how you can add to that path, the actual search path, and then set up a central library like I have, where it's not, I don't have to move it every time a new Cheat Engine version comes out. I can just keep using the same stuff every time and I don't have to worry about, oh, did I update the one in this folder, or did I update the one in the folder for the, you know, newest version, which one did I mess with and close, and, you, you know, that can be a pain. Um, this way you can have a central code base that you can even, you know, use GitHub with and all that kind of stuff, and just keep importing from there, and use all your code, and then, um, probably won't be in this video because it'll just be too long, but I'll share a tool that I've um, it's already shared on the uh, Fearless Sheet Engine forum, but um, we'll go over using that, and um, I'll share that with you so that way you have a, an easy tool to pack all these files in the end without having to manually do it, because that gets to be kind of a pain, especially if you're debugging and updating and all that kind of stuff. Um, so to start, so now we'll go ahead and open up Cheat Engine, um, and I have actually disabled all my... Uh, plug in so this way we, you can actually see what it's going to look like when you're using it at first. Um, eventually I'm going to try and share basically all my plugins this way if you want to use them or actually more so I want to go over actually creating them this way. Not only can you use them but you'll you'll know how they work under the hood. You'll understand it and you can modify it however you want and that kind of thing. I want to get you to that level at some point. Um, but for now we're just going to start with oh, yeah that's not there I can't do that <laughs> um, anyway control M control L we can close this um, so if we actually require something and I'll probably use the term import a lot as well uh, basically the same concept um, but if we require something let's just say no module since that will not exist um, because I want to show the, the air output on this so we can kind of start getting an idea of what path it's actually going to be looking for. Um, one thing you'll notice, and I'll go over a fix I've got for this, is that everything's kind of jumbled onto one line here. Um, but we can slap it in another editor and it'll 
And basically what that is is um, Lua only adds a new line character for the line breaks. And I, I believe it's because Delphi, um, it's underlying UI elements. It may even be Pascal anyway. Um, and if you don't know, uh, Pascal is the base language. Delphi is kind of an extension to it, for what I understand, and it just adds the object-oriented programming to it. I believe it also adds the UI elements and some of that. Um, but at any rate, one of those is what makes it so, like this memo deal here, this giant text box or text area, is um, it requires a, a, a carriage return and a new line for a line break. And that's where we're getting this jumbled text. Um, and we'll fix that formatting at some point. We'll have to go over that so that we can get nicer error messages when it comes to importing. Um, anyway, so you can see here when we try and require no module, it searches all these different paths. Now we can actually see where this is getting it by printing the package.path. clear that out and so with this we can start to see in this wall we say this is all one single line and that's just that's the way it works um, it's actually separated with these uh, it would be semicolon separated values so you can see it actually replaces all those question marks with the no module name um, that way it's actually looking in, and you can see here where by default it does look in that cheat engine. Oh, I can't remember if I went over this in a video I ended up deciding not to use. Um, so I'm just going to talk about it now. Uh, so if we go to a folder I actually got opened over there. Where is it? Apparently I do not. Okay. Open. So if we actually go to our cheat engine folder, um, you'll see, and these ones I haven't really been using yet, um, there is no Lua folder in here. You actually have to make it yourself, and then I'd also suggest setting the prop, you know, going to properties and actually setting the security so that way it will allow you to modify it without you having to constantly give it the okay on, on administrative rights. Um, but then this way, just to start off, you could just start putting stuff directly in the cheat engine folder and run it from there. Um, I really don't tend to use it. I actually add to the path in my own plugins. Um, that way I can use a central one. Um, and then that's normally where I import from. But sometimes when I'm just testing, even I'll start off with just throwing it in here. And this way I kind of keep it separate. And I know it's not part of my actual normal plugins. It's not part of the, the code I use regularly. I'm just playing with it and seeing how it works or something like that. Um, but again, we go back here and you can kind of see it's also just looking straight in the cheat engine folder. It's looking, um, I believe this actually means going back a single directory. So it would actually be looking in program file, share, Lua, um, you could kind of just plug this out, but because of the way working directory works, um, this is how it starts out with. And then here is where we'll actually be using it. This would basically be it's actually looking in the file that uh, Cheat Engine, if you open a table. Um, and simply saving a table won't work. You have to save the table, close it, and then reopen it. Um, Actually, I haven't tested that in a little while. It may be something that's finally gotten changed. But at any rate, that's what I've gotten used to doing. Um, you can try it. Well, I might even try it here in a minute. But at any rate, when we go to do that, we'll actually save a, a table, then reopen it, and that way we can start importing directly from that folder that the table file exists in um, and just create some simple Lua files and start importing those and messing with them. Um, yeah, you can always just include it in the Lua script itself. Um, but like I said, when you really start getting into heavy modules um, or, you know, heavy code that you don't want to repeat all the time, it's really better to go with a modular setup. Um, but we'll go over that more. 
and then you can actually see some of the paths that get added later in it you know like the uh, auto run cheat engine share actually does add inside that code um, to the path to tell it so that way you can import directly from there um, and you can do that kind of setup I actually prefer prefer to use the uh, module notation and that would be oh, and that would be so if we go require no module and then say we have a no module folder you know or whatever module you start with that's your main module holder that holds these sub modules in it you know so let's say it's you know no module dot test and this would be you would actually then have a test dot lua file in a no module directory um, and we can actually see this if we try and import this and so there you can see it's actually doing a little bit more because you know it's um, changing that period to a separator for a directory and then is actually looking directly for a test file and then it still looks for the you know no module directory a test directory within that and then an init.lua you know file and that's something Lua does. Um, pretty much every language kind of has a way of doing that kind of thing. I know Python, it's, it would be main dot, you know, pi or main dot py. Um, and, but this is just Lua's way of doing it. It's an init file. It, you know, initializes the file. I believe that's what it stands for. Um, and that way you can initialize a module. An actual example of one of those would be, you know, like this is my initialize file in my cheat engine table Lua module um, and then this way you can not only could you actually use again more modular notation and import specific sub modules if you want but if I want to just import the whole thing because I know I'm going to kind of use it all anyway or I know I'm going to use most of it and everything I use needs the other stuff as well I can just import this one and then I don't, you know, I can actually just call, I can just call it this way and it will import this file, which will then import everything else. Um, and it's just, like I said, but this is just where we're starting to kind of get the, you know, lay of the land and we'll go from there um, and actually get more into the coding here in a minute. So like I said, we're going to actually just go ahead and start with um, saving this. Since we're not attached, it won't have a, a file name. We'll just go with tutorial. Make that tutorial cheat table. Um, then, like I said, we actually do need to close it and then reopen to get it to actually use this folder as the working directory. But then that way from here, we can actually... We can actually create our, our Lua file that we're going to work with. Um, again, if, if you would prefer, you can just use that Lua engine to do these little tests, um, stuff like that. But I kind of prefer to work with a separate editor. It just, I, I like it better. Um, and that's up to you. This way you could use Notepad++ or um, I believe Skite is actually one of the ones for Lua more. I believe if you actually download uh, Lua for Windows, it'll have that in it as kind of its IDE. Um, but I just prefer Sublime Text. Um, if you want the syntax highlighting like I have specific for Cheat Engine, I do have a, um, a pinned post in the, I believe it's the Cheat Engine topic at the Fearless Cheat Engine forum that you can download this package at. Um, I've added a little bit more to it, but I've also added a highlighting for some of my functions. Um, that way, I've got that, so I don't, you know, if I do a typo, I'll notice right away because it's not highlighting it. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much still the same. And those are pretty simple formats if you want to add to it. Um, anyway, moving on. So, to start with this... Um, I kind of want to get into some of the basics. I don't want to hammer on that too much because I feel like if you really need more basics of Lua, there are plenty of Lua beginner's tutorials that'll still work. 
um, as long as you just stick with basic function declaration and basic stuff like that. I will go over more of the um, actual object oriented programming so we'll create a module that you can create instances of because um, one concept to understand with um, Lua is that um, and I would suggest using a lot of local um, otherwise you pollute the global environment um, and that's not always a good thing. You can get problems. I mean, there are times where you need global variables, but there are times where using local everywhere you can is better. And that's my train of thought is if I do, if it doesn't 100% have to be global, I make it local no matter what the circumstances is just because it it isolates things, it keeps it from some outside code that you forgot about can't change that just in case you reuse a name and you, you're thinking you didn't or you're not using that but it turns out you do require it somewhere else you won't run into conflicts with that and have to trace that down to figure out what's going on you can just know this is isolated so only stuff in this file will be able to access it but again back to the one concept you need to understand with um, Lua is that while you can create different copies of a number or a string um, a table is always a reference unless you do some specific things to kind of change that um, but if you, we were just to make a simple table and then we actually make a copy of that table L2 What we'll actually see here is if we change something in TBL2, it will make that same change in the, the TBL1 table because of the way that it it's a reference when you're using tables. Um, and that is something that's kind of, if you don't realize that, you can run into problems pretty quickly if you're using a lot of tables and you just do a quick table 2 equals table 1 and think you've now made a copy and you can modify the second one and it won't change the first because it does now let's yeah, we'll print that one actually let's print both So we can see here we've set name and TBL1 and then we set TBL2 to TBL, well just TBL, um, and then in the second table we set the name to test and it, it will change both of these tables. Um, now I know I've been showing uh, the require function so far, but um, with basic testing like this, what you're actually going to want to use is do file because this will re import it every single time. It doesn't cache the, the, the Lua bytecode that gets compiled when it requires the file. Um, but once you get to a point to where you're ready to do, you know, the actual coding, will use require more. Um, and with do file, you do have to add the file extension. Require, you don't. Um, I actually believe if you do add the file extension, it'll, it would look for test slash Lua, and we don't want that. But do file, it, it just looks for a file. We would actually... Oh, did I mess something up? Okay, so I messed up the naming on that file. That's why it wasn't importing it correctly. Um, renamed it to actually be test.lua. And then, because I've removed my modules, um, or my plugins, this wasn't getting run, so it's not already in Sheet Engine, so we need to add that. Um, but obviously, if you are already set this up and threw it in, say, the uh, auto run folder, you wouldn't have that issue. It would be there for you to use, or make use of. So I'll try this again. So there we go, we run it, and now you can see that the name has changed in both of these tables, even though we've only set name to test in one of the tables. But that's because these are different references. Um, we can kind of see more of that if we actually just print table, because it will... I 
can't remember if it's actually the memory address. No, oh, duh. So we need to call to string. And then that's where you can actually see that, you know, the reference is to these same table. You know, it's the same table each time. Instead of, say, if we actually did create a third table. get a different number there and that's because of that is a different table entirely um, and thus we could add that you know name and change it and it won't change the other tables because we didn't set the reference of table 2 to table 1 or just TBL um, and so that like I said that is something kind of important to understand uh, with the underlying tables in Lua is every variable of a table is a reference to a table you've created. And I know what I'm about to talk about I've kind of already discussed before, but I just want to try and go over everything for beginners because I do want this series to be a go here and learn, you know, all you need to know to get started with Lua. And I will, I do want to go over more advanced topics eventually, but it definitely won't be an end-all. This is everything you need to ever know about Lua. I'm just not that educated with Lua. Um, so there will, I would definitely say supplement with other sources if you can. Um, pure Lua tutorials. I know I've got Lua for Windows um, installed, and I've used that in the past where to learn more about Lua at its core without Cheat Engine, so that way I could understand Lua because there are some core concepts that don't exist in actual Lua that Cheat Engine gives you access to that makes it a whole different ball game. Um, one example is threading. There is no real threading in Lua. It all runs on a single thread and that is all there is to it. Um, Lua doesn't even have timers uh, like most languages do. There is a way to create timers but it's actually using sockets, you know, the, the net sockets. Um, we won't get into that because Cheat Engine luckily gives us access to timers and threads and, and all these fun things that we can do a lot of neat and complicated things. You know, like, I, you know, you don't even need to always use a timer sometimes. Um, you can actually use a separate thread and use the sleep function and make your own timer, um, which can be handy in some situations because of the way, like, a timer won't return a value and it won't wait on it. You can actually have a complicated section of code that all runs as a single line of you know a single batch of code um, and then have sleep in between certain operations to time it out and that way again you can still use return values and wait on things and do all this but because it's a separate thread it won't freeze the UI and we'll go over more of that later but um, but that was just a concept I wanted to touch on with the idea that um, Cheat Engine does add a lot that isn't Lua. And it is good to just know the difference. That way, if you go to look up something for Lua and you say, well, let me actually see how you do this in Lua, it may be a completely different way. Whereas Cheat Engine may have an easier and more simplistic way to deal with that. And again, the timers is another one just because there's, you would almost need to have a whole module just for making a timer. And that way you could import that timer module and then use a timer. Um, but even there, it's still, it's just events and the network sockets all running on the main thread. Whereas with Cheat Engine, again, we can separate things out and have separate threads running and get way more complicated if we want to. So the next thing I want to go ahead and kind of technically recover here is um, what is a module in Lua? Um, one important thing to, to understand is Lua um, has 
simple types. I mean, um, you've got your strings, and then you've got numbers, you've got functions, and you've got tables. Um, and that's really kind of the bulk of Lua types. There may be more out there, but um, these are the main ones you're going to really be dealing with and that I'm off the top of my head remembering. Um, because even like in other languages, you have, you know, an int or a float or a, you know, short int or long int and all these things um, for ints and float or ints and integers and floating points. Um, Lua doesn't really have that. There is a way to check if a number is a floating point versus an integer, but um, under the hood, it, it really doesn't care necessarily in the beginning. Even if we actually check the type of a number, it will return the word number and not int or float. Um, and thus, when you create a module or anything more complex than the basic types, it'll be a table. And everything is a table in, a, in Lua that isn't, you know, a string or a number or a function. Um, and that's kind of an important concept to understand. Anything, you know, the module or, you know, even if I use the word array, that's really just a table that, in my mind, you're just using, you're not actually setting keys, you're just giving it a list of things. Um, and again, may even call it a list. And you'll hear, if you watch other tutorials, people, you know, that's a common practice, just because even though it's all a table, it, you know, if I'm using the table as a module, then it's a module. If I'm using the table as a list, it's a list. If I'm using it as an array, it's an array. And it just depends upon how I'm using the, the table object is what dictates what it is. Um, and there, some of that you can kind of get into different naming conventions. I know um, many will actually use lowercase for the start of a module. I don't like doing that. I, I like all objects to be uppercase at the beginning. This way I know it's not a function. I know it's, you know, in functions I do like to start lowercase. Um, Whatever naming conventions you come up with is fine. I mean, even before I got really heavy into coding, I actually just looked up, you know, the words naming convention, you know, programming naming conventions and stuff like that and kind of poured through some of the different ways of doing that. Um, and there's a lot of information out there that can kind of help you decide which one you like better. Um, that even gets into like the concept of tabs versus spaces. I am a big fan of tabs. Um, but if you want to use spaces, that's, you know, that's you, man. You do you. Um, the only thing I would say with tabs um, is the simple fact that it's easier to change. You can actually set the tab width to eight spaces or two spaces or whatever, and you don't have to modify anything, and it'll just, things will line up the way you think they should. Um, and that can be handy. Whereas spaces, you know, and some would argue spaces will make it to where it'll be formatted the same on everyone's computer, which if that's what you prefer, but to me, I think, you know, everybody should have, be able to do it their own way if they want to, as long as it doesn't conflict and simply using tabs just doesn't hurt. But luckily Lou is one, even if you mix tabs and spaces, it don't really care. Um, you could do everything with no indent. Um, and I have seen that more times than I want to ever see. Um, and that is something else I want to go and cover real quick. If you have code that looks like this, it is way harder to read. I know and I am bad about, I won't even look at it anymore. I mean, if you post this on a forum and ask for help, I will see this and just nope the fuck out of the situation. Because it's like, yeah, that is a mess, dude. Good luck. Um, so indent your code, add formatting, uh, you know, indent it however you want. I mean, you can do the, when you declare a function, you can do things slightly differently when it uses the brackets in some languages. I mean, I don't, I don't care how you format that, just indent your code with something and be consistent is kind of the big thing. And same thing with naming conventions, being consistent is very important. Because um, if you're mixing and matching stuff, that can be a problem. I mean, when you're first starting out, you may end up using code snippets here and there, but that's where I get into quick copying and pasting. I mean, sure, at first, just so little typos don't screw you up real bad, but at some point, you really do want to get down and actually type out the code. That way, you're not, you, you understand more what's in there than just simply 
control C and control V. I mean, you'll get really good with those keys, but you know, you want to learn to write your own code. So you need to write your own code to learn to do that. Um, and, and trust me, I, I did actually take a course in typing back in high school, but I basically forgot it all before I actually got into Chi Engine. Um, so I was a hunt and pack kind of guy and I still technically kind of am to some extent, but I've just gotten really fast at it. <laughs> um, not faster than anybody that's properly trained out of type, mind you, but I'm still, you know, you may notice I can type pretty decently. Um, and that's something that just comes with time. You'll just have to slowly learn to, to type. Um, you won't like it. I didn't like it, but again, it's just, it's part of the process. If you don't learn that, then you just, you won't write code. And if you don't write the code, you won't learn the code. And if you don't learn the code, you're just right where you started to begin with anyway. So what's the point? Okay. So this video has already seemed like it's getting kind of longer than I meant. Um, so back to what is a module, as I said, it's just a simple table. Um, there's a couple different ways of setting up your modules to, at the start. Um, a lot of modules you'll see actually start out local and then this way we can, you know, just use, um, and modules a special word, so I don't actually use that alone. Um, but I actually prefer, and this, this is a, a common thing, they'll, um, actually include you know your module start out with a lowercase letter you would have the file name as actually module test.lua um, and then you would return your your module and that way when they import it you're not you know when you import it or require it you're not polluting the global environment they can rename it whatever they want use a shorthand or use the same name as the file name um, use whatever naming convention they want and that's fine um, especially the more you're sharing code but if it's you're writing the modules more for you to use um, it sometimes it's just easier to do it your own way the way you like it um, and that's where I actually tend to prefer to make my modules actually global this way I don't have to create a local variable or any of that or a global variable it's already done um, but then still return it so that way when you do require it you could do you know local equal you know local x equals require this and then it will be x would be how you would access that module um, but again because of the way the tables work it would still anything you do to x module will affect the main module or the module test global that we're creating here um, how you do that is up to you um, this is just personal preference. Again, this is just the way I like to, you know, start out modules. Um, in the next video, we'll actually go over actually creating a first module. I'm not sure what yet, but um, we'll get to that. But basically from here, so if we go ahead and save that, and let's go ahead and say, yeah, we've already created a local, so it won't really matter. But if we made that a local function, then we could do this a couple different ways. We could either just make oprint equals oprint um, inside this table, and then we'll have this oprint function within the module test. Um, another notation to use would actually be to do... would actually be to use this kind of notation and then um, and then you could actually just call the local oprint function and then even one more would be just to do it this way um, this way you're and, and how you do that is entirely up to you, just whichever you prefer. Um, in this kind of situation, I would actually generally either go like this and add a comment telling me these are my helpers or something like that. Um, but however you want to set it up, that's, you know, again, it's you're the, you're going to be the one coding and you're going to be the one doing most of the debugging. Hopefully is the idea you'll get to that point. Um, so... 
whatever makes sense to you and works out better and don't be afraid to change if you try one and figure out part way through that you just it, it's not working the way you thought it would and you don't actually like it um, or cumbersome or something like that um, change it I know I've done that um, and actually had large modules I've had to go back through and change a lot of things to to reflect that and it it can be cumbersome but once you get to the point to where you have your methods and your ways of, that you prefer um, it can make life a lot easier on you just because now it's all set up the same and you're being consistent and it's a, you know a tested way that you've done it that works for you um, but I would still also again look at some of those conventions that are that are common in programming because you know programmers have written a lot of code so when they tell you something's a really bad habit to get into listen to them because they probably know um, if it's one random guy and everybody else is disagreeing then obviously take that with a grain of salt but if a hundred programmers tell me doing something is bad or just going to get me into a bad habit and I'm going to run into problems at some point I would absolutely say I will listen to them because they probably know what the hell they're talking about and have pulled out enough hair to warn me um, but we'll kind of go on from there so <coughs> as I said here if we go ahead and save this we could then import and uh, the do file will work um, a lot like the um, the require again the only difference is that um, but this way we can go ahead and do x.oprint oh yeah it's not going to highlight it that way anyway x.oprint and then you know pass it an object um, whatever it happens to be oh, got an error here what did I do wrong oh need to actually add that And then um, this is something special with Lua. Um, basically, it'll just be this will capture all arguments. So we could pass a hundred arguments and, and catch them all with this one thing. Um, and you can actually still use it in conjunction with with other things. Um, that way, you can have name parameters and then have a catch all later. Um, there are a lot of functions that basically do this kind of thing. And then we can go ahead and pass it to different strings and it will still print both of those even though we're only naming one of the arguments and then just using a catch-all for the rest. Um, and again, um, it will catch all arguments at that point. And that way you just don't have to, and we'll go over more on different ways of interacting with that. Um, and that open function, you can kind of get an idea of one way is to turn it into a table and then iterate through that table to catch all your arguments. Um, but, but this is kind of the basics of a, a Lua module. Um, again, just remember it's a table, and tables are references to an object. Um, but that was kind of the main points I wanted to make. Um, in the next video, we'll actually start creating a module. Um, and then from that point, and then that's when we'll actually go into this function here um, to know how to import that into a, a table as a table file so you can distribute your modules in a table and just still share that one single table file and not have to, you know, tell people to unpack a directory and keep it all in the same spot and blah 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 it, it'll be isolated by itself um, and because of the way this works it will use the table files before anything else if you set the release mode to true or really anything that will evaluate to true technically um, but more on that later anyway on to the next one